Hallelujah. This is a day the Lord has made. We've been having a great time in the Lord. We're glad to have each and every one of you with us today in service. And uh, today, let God bless you. He wants to bless you. Let him bless you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. We're very happy to have uh, Brother Morrell Cornwell with us. And uh, we just love Brother Cornwell. He's a great man. And we're glad to have him as a friend. And, uh, he's been doing a lot of preaching around as usual and came, I think, just now from Illinois, preaching a conference out there. And uh, so he's going to be with us this morning and the Lord willing tonight. So we're going to have a great time with the Lord. I want you to let God have his way in your lives. Listen with your hearts. And let's be ready to respond to the word. What do you say? God's ready to do a great and mighty thing for us. Praise God. Brother Cornwell, we love you. Uh, we're happy to have you in the state of Maine. I've been getting to have him about once a year. We have a way of luring him up here. Hallelujah. <laughs> But we're happy that we get to have him, and uh, he's one of my one of my good friends in the gospel. I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends, a lot of friends in the gospel. But this is one of my good friends in the gospel, brother Cornwell. Come, take your liberty in the Lord. Thank you, brother Stoops. Everybody say praise the Lord. Why don't we stand together for just a moment? Now, I, I heard what you said a while ago when you said turn around and bless somebody's finance, but uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not correcting you, Elder, but I, I, that was a little bit generic. I want you to turn to five people and look them square in the eye and say, you are going to get a raise on your job. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, if you don't have a job or your own Social Security or, or something like that, say you're going to get a raise on your paycheck. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. You say, Brother Cornwell, is that scriptural? The Bible says, you shall have whatsoever you say. I had a woman uh, one time, she was always telling her kids, uh, you better be careful, you're going to break your arm. Better be careful, you're going to break your leg. Well, when the kid broke his arm and his leg, uh, she couldn't figure out what happened. I said, you told him he was. You, you said it, praise God. Everybody say, you're going to be blessed. Can I have an amen? You're going to be blessed. Hey, listen, we, we are citizens of Maine. We're citizens of, of Augusta. We're citizens of the United States, but we have a citizenship in heaven. And when there's darkness all around us, God gives us light. Can I have an amen, somebody? Praise God. I, I want to thank you for the invitation to come to, to the Maine district. The main state, praise God. Uh, when, when, I, when I come to Maine, uh, I'm always driving in a tunnel. We were coming uh, up to the freeway yesterday and or last night. Trees on the left side of the road, trees on the right side of the road. And I felt like I was hemmed in. Amen. The state tree of Kansas is the telephone pole. Praise God. Uh, Y'all have got water. Uh, uh, we don't have water in Kansas. We have a few man-made ponds. Uh, but y'all have got water. For a fact, Maine, uh, the, the percentage of the land that is water in Maine is higher than any other state. And y'all have water. Y'all have trees. Praise God. And uh, I won't tell you what else you have. Praise God. Is God good? Anybody glad to be in the house of God this morning? 
I want to thank my son for being able to come with me today. Praise God. Uh, he is the senior pastor, and uh, the senior pastor and the bishop are both gone. They don't tell you what's happening at home this morning. All the hindrances are out of the way, and they're probably having good church this morning. Praise God. Uh, I, I don't need to tell you how much I love your pastor. Uh, they're coming out in uh, uh, December to be with us. And, uh, uh, Elder, uh, if you want to come and join our staff, uh, I'll give you my position. And praise God, we'd love to have you to pastor in the state of Kansas. And if they mistreat you here... If they mistreat you in Maine, we'll take you in Kansas. Amen. For a fact, we'll let you be superintendent. Brother Khan uh, fell off the roof and nearly broke his head. And uh, we'll put him aside and we'll make you the superintendent. Praise God. Amen. Uh, our people love your pastor. For a fact, uh, the last time he was with us, we had a number of healings uh, in just a powerful, powerful service. Praise God. And... Um, and I, I love Brother Stoop, praise God. And Sister Stoops, I want you to know I haven't opened that Budweiser. I will never live down that sermon, praise God. Open your Bible with me this morning. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not a long-winded preacher, and, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I did borrow a Bible that has a habit of being long-winded. Uh, we pay our preachers in Wichita by how long they preach. The shorter you preach, the more you get paid. <laughs> Hallelujah. The book, <laughs> the book of Luke chapter 15, and uh, I am not going to preach long, but I want to preach for just a few minutes this morning. Thank you, Brother Stoops, uh, for the kindness of your family and the church and uh, your men. I just, uh, I'm overwhelmed by your kindness, praise God. Uh, I was out here a year before last, and uh, we was uh, uh, in, up in Fort Kent, and I had a heart attack, and uh, it was just a bad scene, and uh, your pastor stayed with me. I thank him for that, and I am perfectly all right. For a fact, I, I just came from the cardiologist. He gave me a clean bill of health. I have no heart damage, and uh, for a fact, the doctor said I'm not even a heart patient anymore. Praise God. And our cardiologist uh, come to the house of God, and I went to see him, and he asked uh, if he could come back again. He was overwhelmed at our worship and our praise, and that's what God does. Can I have an amen? The book of Luke, chapter 15, and verse 1. Then drew near unto him all of the republicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. I, I have a policy in our church that if anybody wants to feed me, I let them. And he spake this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep? Everybody say a hundred sheep. If he lose one of them, doth not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he left upon his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. Everybody say, I am a sinner. We are all sinners before God. Thank God we're saved by the grace of God. Anybody glad you're saved? Did you know you did not earn that salvation? That God gave it to you? Can I have an amen? He paid the price. Verse number eight. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends, her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and you can be seated. Praise God. The Lord is one of the greatest 
at using contrast uh, to get our attention uh, of anybody I have ever known. I am, I am not a decorator. Uh, I could live in a barn or a shack, and uh, if I had a bed and a heater and an air conditioner and a, a Taco Bell burger, I'm fine. Praise God. I, I'm just not hard to please. But that being said, uh, uh, my wife thinks sometimes I was raised in a barn, and little does she realize I wasn't raised in a barn, but the house that I lived in uh, was turned into a barn when we moved out. There was 11 children and mom and dad, and we lived in a, a three-room shack, and uh, when we moved out, they turned it into uh, a hay barn. But my wife is a little bit more particular than I am. Uh, we built a house one time, and, uh, and she said, uh, I want to do the painting. And I said, no, I'll do the painting. She said, I will do the decorating. I said, I will do the decorate. Now, fellas, the best way to have a happy marriage is learn the Bible and obey the Bible. If you'll obey the Bible, everything else will work out. Just simply obey them that have the rule over you. And so I, uh, I, went, to the, I went to the store and I, I negotiated and, and I worked with people until I got the paint down as cheap as I could buy it. And uh, it was kind of an off-white color, and uh, I could get it very cheap. For fact, it was about half price uh, of all the other paint. And so I bought the cheapest paint uh, and the most generic paint uh, that you could buy, and I had the whole house painted uh, in that generic color. And uh, little do you realize that some people hear, but they don't hear. And so when I was gone, my wife went to the store and she negotiated a price for the highest price paint in town. And uh, when I came in, uh, the house was repainted and uh, she said, you only put on primer. And consequently, uh, she repainted the house. But one of the things that she did that, that, that I, I can't see with my eyes, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I can add numbers and I can do calculus and I can do differential equations and I can solve thermodynamic problems and, and I can do all kinds of things like that. But when it comes to women's stuff, I'm just not very good uh, at decorating or painting or, or, or if, if, if I was going to build this building, I'd paint it all white, praise God. But, you know, that's not very palatable to a lot of people. And uh, she did something that I'd never seen before. She put one wall a completely different color, and it contrasted uh, with the rest of the colors of the house. And, 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 and it, it turned out that it, was a, it turned out to be very beautiful because she had an eye of knowing how to make something comfortable and how to build a relationship with that which she was working with. And that's what God is doing in this passage. Uh, he's using contrast uh, to bring us to a relationship with him, praise God. And in the this passage, uh, there are three different entities uh, that have no relationship with each other. There's a, a lost sheep, there is a lost coin, and there is a lost sheep. Uh, and you ask, now how is God going to get our attention uh, with a lost sheep, a lost coin, uh, or a lost son? Praise God. And I want to go through each one of these uh, just briefly uh, to help you understand uh, that a man had a hundred sheep. And uh, one of them uh, was lost uh, when they passed under the rod and he counted them uh, as they went into the corral for the night. Uh, there was only 99 uh, and he realized that there was a sheep uh, that was not in uh, the fold. Praise God. Now there are some characteristics uh, about sheep that I want to bring to your attention. Number one, they have very poor eyesight. Number two, they have very uh, 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 poor sight sense of smell, and uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, they, uh, they can't hear real well, 
but they respond to a rod and they will respond to a rock and they will respond to a dog. And there is no indication that the shepherd had a dog and somehow this sheep was lost. Now, how did the sheep get lost? I don't think that the sheep one day uh, sat down and said, okay, tomorrow I'm going to run away from the shepherd, praise God. And I think sometimes uh, when I look around at my own church, uh, we have people that resemble uh, sheep. Uh, it's unbelievable how much uh, they resemble a sheep. Uh, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't smell. And they have to be in the flock and they have to be around the shepherd in order to survive. I want to say, first of all, I thank God for my shepherd. Can I have an amen? When I was a young saint coming up, I thank God I had a shepherd that he had a rod, he had a rock, and he was a dog, praise God. I remember getting the Holy Ghost uh, as a sophomore in college, uh, and I sat on the front row, and uh, I, I went to college uh, not necessarily to get an education, but it was right in the heart of the Vietnam War. Uh, we were letting our hair grow long, and we'd pulling our clothes off. We was wearing sandals and beads and crosses, uh, and, 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 and we, was, uh, we was the first ugly generation, in other words. And I, I, I couldn't grow a beard because I wasn't shaving yet. But my hair was getting long, and, and uh, I, I rebelled against blue jeans and, and, and neckties and shirts and all that. And so my roommate invited me to the house of God. And so I came to the house of God, and all I had on was a pair of blue shorts. And uh, I didn't realize that if you are a sinner, you sat on the back row. Nobody told me that sinners can only sit on the back row. And so when my roommate came uh, in the house of God, I followed him, and he sat on the second row. But I don't like the second row. I don't like the third row. I like the first row. And so I came and I sat down on the front row right in front of the preacher who was the holiest preacher in America. And I sat on the front row, and, uh, and, and the song leader was up singing, and I, I didn't know that sinners are not supposed to sing in the house of God. I thought only saints, uh, uh, you know, I found out later only saints can sing in the house of God. And so uh, they said, they stand, and I learned a little song, and I sang with them. I held my songbook out, praise God. And when the, when the pastor said, everybody praise the Lord, I clapped my hands like everybody else. When he said, stand, I stand. Uh, I looked around, everybody else was shouting. I'd done a little shout, praise God. Can, can, you, can you vision back in 1967, 1968, uh, uh, in a holy roller church, uh, a, a boy sitting on the front row with a pair of shorts on, and he's dancing with everybody else, praise God. And, but anyway, I got the Holy Ghost, and, and my pastor was a shepherd, praise God. And he'd take that rod, and, and he'd kind of tap me. Actually, he didn't just kind of tap me. He'd whack me, praise God. I thank God. I look back, and I thank God for a pastor that loved me enough and cared for me enough, and he kept all the wolves off of my back. I said he kept all the wolves off of my back. I didn't realize then that he told the people in the church, leave him alone. I'll take care of him. Because everybody in the church was wanting to run me off because I didn't look like them. I didn't smell like them. I didn't talk like them. I didn't act like them. Can I have an amen to somebody? I thank God for a shepherd that loved the sheep. Even if I was a rebellious sheep, he still loved me, praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, there ought to be room in the house of God for everybody. You know why? Everybody I know and everybody that I don't know, we need Jesus more than we need anything else in our lives. K. 
Can I have an amen? Thank God. The sheep did not intend to be lost. The sheep did not run away because he was rebellious. The sheep he just kept his head down and kept eating, and the flock went one way, and he went the other way. Can I say that again? I said the flock went one way, and the sheep went the other way. He didn't hear the flock move. He didn't see the shepherd move. And somehow, in the midst of a hundred sheep, he wandered away. And one hour, he looked up, and it started getting dark. And when it started getting dark, you know what that sheep done? The sheep started bleeding. Meh! Meh! Because he was lost. He was not lost because he wanted to be lost. He was not lost because he was rebellious. He was not lost because he went out and took drugs. He was not lost because he went out to drink. He was not lost because he went out to hockey talk. He was lost just in the course of living his life. And when the shepherd found out that the sheep was gone, the shepherd was as frantic as the sheep was. And he left the 99 in the wilderness and he went after that one lost sheep. I believe that the shepherd knew the name of the sheep. Can I have an amen to somebody? My sheep hear my voice, and another they will not follow. And he got to calling for the sheep, and the sheep got to bleeding for the shepherd. And there came a moment when the shepherd heard the bleeding of the sheep, and the, and the sheep heard the sound of the shepherd, praise God. And when they got together, there was rejoicing. Can I have an amen? Now let me just see if I can put this in our own language. We live in a busy world. We live in a world of chaos. Maybe, maybe, maybe Kansas is different from Maine. But I'm going to tell you, we live in a world of chaos. A lot is being said right now about what's going on uh, in St. Louis, and it's bad. And I, I, I have no comments about that. I don't know what happened. But I know that there's a lot of trouble uh, in St. Louis. But what we don't realize, that that scene uh, is being played out all across America. We have a, a, a deacon, if I can call him a deacon. Uh, he's on our board of elders, our board of trustees. He is the most gentle man that you have ever met. There's not anything that he would not do for you. He is just a beautiful person. He has a, a beautiful wife, beautiful children and grandchildren. He is a lieutenant uh, in the police department. And he got a call. And, and in the call of a domestic violence situation, him and two other officers went to the, the, the domestic violence situation. And when he walked in, there was a man that had beat up his wife, had taken a knife and had already uh, cut her, and she was bleeding and bloody and bruised. And when the police showed up, she was screaming for help and, and, and begging him not to kill her. And, and he had her around the neck, and the police tried to talk him out of his weapon. Please put your weapon down. Please put your weapon down. Please put your weapon down. And, and, and he said, and they said, let her go. Put your weapon down. Drop the weapon, please. And, and the man didn't. And he reached up to cut his wife's throat and to kill her. And this, this wonderful, wonderful man in my church. I mean, I cannot tell you how wonderful a man he is. And he's been on my board of trustees for the last 20 years. He is a gentle person. But he had to take his service uh, a pistol and had to shoot the man in the head and killed him uh, and saved that woman's life. And now this police officer, he simply laid his weapon down, took his gun belt off and laid it down. And, and, and fell on his knees and began to weep. In the last couple of weeks, he has been a frantic case. And it's like the sheep 
without a shepherd. But I thank God that the shepherds of our church have come to his rescue and said, listen, you saved a woman's life. You are a hero. But yet he is a sheep and he's screaming and yelling and bawling and squalling. Why? Because he wants to get back in the flock. He wants God to help him. Let me tell you something. You're not always lost because you're a bad sinner. You're not always lost because you are a drug addict. You're not always lost because you're an alcoholic. Sometimes you just get separated from the flock and you need the flock and the flock is looking for you. The lost coin is a different story. Uh, in my family, we are an integration of a number of cultures. My grandfather on my mother's side is Cajun French. My grandmother uh, is a German on my mother's side. On my father's side, uh, our mother is very English. And my grandfather on my father's side is English. So we got a big mixture of English and German and the overriding French. And uh, in our family, when my mother married my father and they produced children, it's kind of amazing how that different children can come out of the same womb and be so different. I have, I have four children, and I'm not sure who their father or their mother is. I, I, I can look at one of them and say, he is like this grandfather. And I look at another one, and he's like the other grandfather. And I look at another one, and he's like uh, his grandmother. And it's amazing how two kids can come out of the same womb, and yet they can be as different as daylight and dark. In our family, there were 11 children. And on my father's side... As far back as you can go, they are heathens. They, they was raised in logging camps. They was raised in the swamps. Uh, they was raised to raise hell. They were sinners personified. On my mother's side, all of her family are apostolic preachers. And they say opposites attract. My mother and dad really must have attracted each other because they are very different. My mother is a very tender woman. And, and, and I remember preaching one sermon and she came immediately down the aisle and I laid hands on my mother and my mother received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And my father was a different story altogether. He doesn't comprehend Jesus. He doesn't have any comprehension of the Bible. He has no comprehension of going to church. He has no comprehension uh, of living for God. Uh, it's, it's like that he is an alien out there somewhere. And he's looking down on us. And, and, and his words are, we are not of this world. You know, he just... Uh, he, he's, he's a strange duck, to say the least. They have zero spiritual attraction. They, 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 nothing, there's nothing spiritual that you can say to them that, that will touch them. On the other hand, my mother has the gift of healing. And, and when, when you're sick, I want my mother to pray for me. Many a time, she laid her hands on me, and God instantly would heal me. My uncles are preachers. My cousins are preachers. For a fact, I got one cousin that pastors the largest apostolic church in the state of Texas. And uh, my grandfather uh, started uh, the largest church uh, in the United Pentecostal Church. And, 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 and all of their life, and, and it's way back as, as far as I can remember, uh, 
that side of the family was apostolic, Pentecostal, Holy Ghost field, shouting, running, dancing, praise God. On my father's side, they, they never went to church. Uh, my, I have never seen my father in church until the latter years of his life. And what I'm seeing is there's a contrast there. And, and, and the children, I've got brothers uh, that if you even say Jesus, they'll fall on their knees right now and start crying and praying. And i got another brother that, that he, he, church is as foreign to him uh, as, as, as anything you've ever seen. He's like a, a coin. Uh, he's completely dead to the things of the Spirit. Nothing can move him. And, and yet... The Bible says this woman, she had ten coins, and she lost one of these coins. A coin does not have feeling. A coin is as strange to God as anything else. And, and, and yet this woman said, I've got to find that person, that coin that has no feeling. We are dealing with a world that has no spiritual barometer whatsoever. And sometimes the church will say, well, maybe we just ought to leave them alone and to their sales. No, God says uh, there's a way to reach the Cohen, the one that has no feelings, uh, the one that has no spiritual perception. Just because uh, you come into the house of God and you sit here and nothing can move you, there is something that can move you because somebody's going to clean the house. Somebody's going to garnish the place uh, until they find you. Uh, and when they find you, they're going to bring you back to themselves, praise God. There's no such thing as a person that's beyond the reach of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will do whatever is necessary to reach a person, praise God. Let me, let me see if I can give you a personal example. Uh, we, we teach a lot of Bible studies in Wichita, and, and uh, this girl came to our church uh, from the University of Kansas, or from Kansas State. And the reason she came was she met a boy on the campus that was apostolic. He told her about our church, and she lived in Wichita, and so she shows up at our church. Well, when she comes, uh, one of our Bible teachers immediately uh, got with her and started a Bible study. And uh, it wasn't long before she received the Holy Ghost. And then her mother came in to the Bible study, and she immediately got the Holy Ghost. And her sister came, and her husband came, and they got the Holy Ghost. Well, when you've lived all of your life as sinners, and all of a sudden your family around you starts coming to the house of God and starts changing their lifestyle, and, and if you don't have any spiritual perception, well, just like this man, the husband, the father, uh, he started getting angry. And so uh, his wife came to see me, and she said, Pastor, she said, I'd like my husband to be saved. But he said, he doesn't like you. And I said, well, join the club. There's a lot of folks don't like me. And I said, but that's no reason not to come to the house of God. And uh, he said, well, he, you know, I'm coming to see you because I need help. And he said he would never come to you because he's not going to let some uneducated Pentecostal preacher counsel with him. I said, he said that, huh? That, that I was an uneducated holy roller. Is that what he was saying? He said, yes. I said, well, you go tell that thunderhead of yours that I have more degrees than he has thermometers. I said, you tell him that I'm a chemical engineer by profession, that I have a master's degree in biomedical engineering, and that I have work in nuclear technology, and, and tell him that if he wants to compare educations, uh, I'll compare with him any day. Well, she went back. I had no idea that she'd tell him that. And he could not believe that somebody educated uh, could stand in a pulpit and yell at people. Isn't that amazing? 
Everybody thinks preachers are dumb. And I might add, the dumber you are, the better the preacher you are. I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to teach the Word of God. It takes the anointing of God. It takes the Holy Ghost. Can I have an amen? God takes zeros and makes hundreds out of them. Praise God. But let me tell you something. If you come to God and you think you're something, you're going to end up as a zero before you find God. And then God will remake you. Praise God. Somebody said amen. And so uh, he finally, he broke down and he came to see me. And he let me know I don't like you. I don't like this church. I'm going to work to get my family out of this church. I'm going to work to get my children out of this church. I don't like Pentecostals. I don't like this church. And I said, why do you not like the church? He said, I don't know why I don't like it. I just don't like any church. I said, now we're getting somewhere. It was a fact that he had never felt God's presence before. Can I have an amen? I said he had never felt the presence of God. But let me tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, when that lost coin, that person that doesn't have any feelings, when God touches you, I'm going to tell you, he can bring that coin to life and cause rejoicing in heaven. Can I have an amen, somebody? And so his wife, his daughter, his son-in-law, we all got to praying for him. And we prayed and we prayed. We had days of fasting for him. I mean, we prayed together. We fasted together. And one day, uh, he was in his truck, and he was going out to the ranch uh, to feed his cows. Uh, and he's out on a country road. And the presence of God comes into that truck. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Nobody is past the reach of Jesus Christ. His ear is not heavy. His arm is not shortened. That he cannot hear you and that he cannot reach you and that he cannot touch you. If Steve was ever a lost Cohen, he was a lost Cohen. And he's driving that truck and he's he got a bale of hay, and he's got cattle feed uh, on his truck, and he's going out to feed his cows uh, like he did every day of his life. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came into that truck, and he hit his brake, praise God. I mean, it was like God ran over him. He slammed on his brakes. Uh, he looked around. Uh, he couldn't figure out what happened. And, 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 and chill bumps got all over him, and, and his hair stood up on the back of his neck, uh, and and, 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 and he tried to run from it. And so he jammed on the accelerator. But just because you jam your accelerator doesn't mean that God's going to get out of your truck. I feel the Holy Ghost here. There's somebody here, you have said many times, that God cannot touch me. There is no person beyond the touch of Jesus Christ. He was on the highway. He pulled his truck down into the ditch, ran into a fence, got out of his truck, stood beside his truck. All of a sudden, he broke down. Tears started running down his face. A man 50-something years old had never wept a day in his life, just began to cry like a baby, praise God. And he picked up his cell phone. You know who he called? He called me, praise God. <laughs> Steve called me, and... and he said, Reverend Cornwell. I said, yes. He said, this is Steve. I said, Steve. you got to understand, Steve had cussed me. Steve had gotten mean with me. Steve hated me. Steve talked about me, said ugly things about me, cussed me in front of his family, tried to, 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 to tell his family how ugly and mean. And, and he said, I was a shyster. I was only out for money. And, and he, he, he's deceiving all of them. He said everything bad about a preacher he could say. He said, Reverend Cornwell, he said, this is Steve. He said, I, I'm in trouble. I said, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, something come into my truck. I said, what was it, Steve? He said, I don't know. I thought you could tell me what it is. 
I said, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. Uh, we've been praying for you. We've been fasting for you. We've been trying to help you, praise God. He said, you mean it was God that came into my truck? I said, yes, sir, it was God that came into that truck. Uh, and he broke down and knelt down beside his truck uh, and started repenting. He said, Brother Coleman, he said, I talk bad about you. Would you forgive me? Pastor, I, I cussed you. Would you forgive me? Oh, what do I have to do to get right with God? I said, you're getting right with God right now. Because when the coin and the spirit meet each other, God will always bring you to the place where he can use you. There is no one beyond the reach of the arm of God. That Sunday, he was at the church. He walked in the back doors. And, and he would lead his family. His wife came. His daughters came. His son-in-law came. Uh, uh, his, his grandchildren came. And, and he didn't stop at the pew. He came straight to the altar. He said, I'm ready to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And we baptized him, that coin, in the name of Jesus. But let me tell you something, he's not a coin anymore. He turned out to be one of the greatest fellows I've ever known. He has such a sweet disposition. His wife said, I can't believe how much my husband has changed. He's been mean all these years, and now he's a child of God. Let me tell you something. God wants to convert you. God wants to change you. It doesn't matter where you are or where you came from. I'm going to close with this. There was a third entity, a lost son. Sons are not coins, and sons are not sheep. A son has a mind of his own. Do you know? Whether we like to believe this or not, our children have a choice that they have to make. Daddy, you cannot make the decision for your son. Mother, you cannot make a decision for your children. We raise our children, and at a very young age, we try to put a conscience within them. We do everything right. Well, not everything, but most of the things. We give our children the best opportunity that we know how to help them make right decisions. I cannot overemphasize the fact that as a parent, you are to parent your kids not necessarily to be friends with your kids. Because there's a time when you have to say no, and there's a time when you have to say yes. Can I have an amen? And it would be nice if we were the only ones that had influence in your son's life. But this particular son did not just appear in chapter 15. He actually appeared in chapter 12 when somehow the son got among the Pharisees and scribes. And he started listening to the wrong voices. I don't understand how a godly father, one that raises the children, and yet they... Children sometimes can, can so easily be persuaded by people that they don't know, that people that don't have the same values as their parents do. But that's the reality that we live in. And uh, this son, in chapter 12, the Lord looked over at this son and said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, for they are hypocrites. And even the Lord tried to warn the son that he was listening to the wrong voices. But somehow, the son was persuaded by the wrong voices. Our kids, when they grow up, go to college. 
I don't know what University of Maine is like or the, the colleges in Maine, but at the University of Kansas and Kansas State and Emporia State and Wichita State and Fort Hay State and Pittsburgh State, I can tell you that the professors don't care about what mom and dad believes. Can I tell you that the people that, that, that sit on bar stools when your son walks in, they're not going to say to them, you ought not to be here because mom and dad doesn't want you to be here. No, they're going to invite your kids. They're going to, they're going to get your kids to drink. And, and, and it amazes me. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of children in our church. Uh, last Sunday morning, we had 460 children between the ages of 5 and 11 in the house of God. And we had 23 of them get the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and, and, and you know what? The world doesn't care the values you teach your children. There are all kinds of voices out there in the world that's reaching for you. But more than that, they are reaching for your children. How many times have I preached against alcohol in my pulpit? And I am a teetotaler. I am against alcohol in every shape, form, or fashion. And, uh, and yet, uh, we had kids grew up in our church. One of the kids decided he was going to drink, and he bought alcohol for the rest of our kids. And I had to deal with it one day, and, and uh, I said, if you buy alcohol again for these kids, I will personally see to it that you go to jail and they throw away the key. And I said, for a fact, you are no longer a member of this youth group. And I had to separate this young man from the youth group because he was polluting every kid in our church. And, and, and believe it or not, uh, he laughed at me and, and said, you're not going to keep me from drinking. I said, I can't stop you from drinking, but I can separate you from those uh, that, that we want to save. And, and a few years ago, just about four years ago, I buried him uh, from an alcohol overdose. Uh, he did what he wanted to do. And yet, but I saved uh, the kids uh, that I separated from him. Your kids uh, are, are, are not just going to come under your influence, uh, but they're going to come under the influence uh, of everybody they meet. Uh, the college professors uh, are going to have influence over them. Uh, I want you to know that the bar rooms are going to have influence over them. It's amazing how a kids uh, try drugs knowing that there are certain drugs that will kill you. And why a kid will take crystal meth is beyond me. Uh, I have buried 15 teenagers in the last 37 years uh, that's been shot down on the streets uh, of Wichita because they listened to the wrong voices uh, if they would listen to one voice. Uh, we have one rule in our church. Uh, our kids have to be off the street at 11 o'clock in order to be a part of our youth group. Uh, and all 15 of those kids uh, were killed after 11 o'clock at night. I feel a strong presence of God in this room. We would like to raise our kids to be holy and good and kind. But the truth of the matter is, there's too many voices out there that's competing against the voice of the church and competing against the voice of mom and dad. I, I, this is not my notes, but I'm going to insert it here. Whatever you do, you better understand that there are influences on your children that you don't have any idea. And you better hope and pray that the pew and the pulpit are working together to save your children. Ladies and gentlemen, if my pastor uh, said something was wrong or if he even hinted something was wrong, we separated ourselves from it. Uh, but that's not the way it is today. The preacher has to preach his heart out in order to get you to understand he's only trying to save you from things that's down the road someplace. And this son came under the influence of the wrong crowd. And he came to his father and said, Dad, give me the portion of goods that belongeth to me. He wasn't a dumb coin. He wasn't a dumb sheep. He was a son. He chose of his own will to rebel against the teachings of the father. And he said, I want the goods that's going to fall to me after you die, but I want it now. And in the wisdom of the father, he divided his living and gave the son his inheritance. 
And the Bible said not many days after he left home and spent his fortune on riotous living. There's one thing I got to say about that. Thank God that the father stayed at home and kept the lights burning and kept the praise going and kept the church intact. Can I have an amen? I thank God when you can't do anything else, you just stand and withstand everything that comes against you because the church of the living God is the only thing that's going to survive in this end time. Praise God. Thank God for the church. I said thank God for the church. I said thank God for preachers. Thank God for pastors that are still holding out the light. He spent all, wasted his substance with righteous living, and ended up in the pig pen. He was rebellious. He was aggravating. He was mean. He didn't think. Everything bad that you can say about the son, he did. But there's something this I want to tell you something. The father was still praying for him. And all of a sudden, the Bible says the son came to himself. And in the pig pen, he lifted up his eyes and said, My father's house has servants that have more than me. I will arise and I will go back to my father's house. And I will say, Father, I have sinned against thee and I have sinned against heaven. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I'm not worthy to be your son. But let me tell you something. We got a God that's bigger than that. He doesn't want to make you a servant. He wants to make you a child. He wants to make you a son of God. Can I have an amen? We had a young man, I'm closing. We had a young man that met our district board for license just the last time we met. He's a tall young man, beautiful family. He married a girl in our church. They got a, a baby, and he met the district board for license. He was raised in an apostolic home. He was raised in a Christian home. His, his mother and father are involved in the ministry. His grandfather was Brother Timothy Creel that pastored Westlake, Louisiana, and, and his great-grandfather. He has five generations back in the Pentecostal movement. But when he got in high school, uh, he started running with the wrong crowd, got involved in drugs, went to jail, went to prison, and spent time in prison, spent time in jail, uh, was on probation, was on parole. And we got special permission to let him come to Wichita, Kansas uh, from his parole officer that he might become a part of our church. And, 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 and we took him in. And he said, I will never forget when I was in jail. And I had reached the bottom of my ladder. I fell on my knees and I said, God, I have wrecked my life. My life is over. Would you, if you can just find some way to forgive me. And God, when he got down on his knees and started praying, God started working miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And I'm telling you what, that entire district board began to weep and hug him when he told us the testimony of where God had brought him from. Let me tell you something. You may be a lost son. You may have made some bad decisions. You may have gone the wrong direction. Somebody might have influenced you. It doesn't matter what. But I'm going to tell you something. God loves you. I'm going to tell you right now, God loves you. Can I have an amen? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you don't give up on anybody. I said you never give up on anybody. Oh, um, let's stand, would you? I'm gonna tell you one more time. You don't give up on anybody. Hallelujah. You may be a lost sheep. You may be a lost coin. You may be a lost son. It doesn't matter what category you fit in. The arm of God is not short. That he cannot touch you. Can I have an amen to somebody? Every head bowed and our eyes closed as the musicians come. I'm just going to take just a few moments here. If you're here this morning, I don't care what category you might fit in. I don't know whether you are hardened in your heart. I don't know whether you have 
rebelled against God. I don't know whether you just wandered away, but somewhere the Holy Ghost is standing right beside you right now. I feel the presence of God touching you right now. Amen. If you need God in your life, I want you to slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I need the Lord in my life. That's all over this building, all over this building. P please put your hand down. Every, every head bowed and our eyes are closed for just a moment. Hallelujah. If you love the Lord down in your heart, would you lift your hand and say, Pastor, I really do love the Lord. I need God. Would you lift your hand and say, Lord, I need you right now. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to tell you something. God loves you more than you realize he loves you. He's coming to your pew right now. He's touching you right now. I wonder if you'd like to come and stand here at the front with me right now. Hallelujah. Would you step out of that pew and, and come stand here around this front with me? I feel the Lord about to do a miracle here right now. Would you lift your hands and pray right now? God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and softly begin to praise the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, the presence of God is literally falling on you right now. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. My goodness, the Holy Ghost is falling on you right now. The Holy Ghost is falling on you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, touch right. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord together, everybody. Let's just praise the Lord together right now. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. I feel the Holy Ghost on you right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There is a wonderful presence of God that's touching you right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh my. Feel the presence of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the Let Holy Spirit now just fell on you. The Holy Ghost Lord, is hovering all around you right now. In the name Here of Jesus. Am, In the name of Jesus. Here I am. In the name of Jesus. My goodness. I give all myself the presence of God. To you. Just touched you. The Lord would speak to you and say, Draw close to Him. Draw close to Him right now. 
draw close to the Lord right now. My goodness. Your spirit My goodness. My goodness. My goodness. The Holy Ghost is on you guys. Here I am. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and just praise the Lord right now. Let's just praise the Lord right now. Let's just praise the Ah. Uh -huh. 